Station. I'm Linda Zimmerman. Join Michael Warden and me for Murder in the Hudson Valley, Tuesdays at 6 p.m. We'll look into notorious homicide cases from around the region and follow the case from the moment the crime scene is discovered up to the final verdict. We'll discuss the suspects, evidence, forensic techniques, and legal battles used to identify and convict the guilty. Murder in the Hudson Valley, Tuesdays at 6 p.m., only on HudsonRiverRadio.com. HudsonRiverRadio.com, a subsidiary of Glacier Entertainment, LLC, potentially successful multi-hundred dollar corporation. Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. It's six o'clock. This is HudsonRiverRadio.com. So you know what you're doing. You are getting dirty with us on this chilly Monday. <laughs> I am Allison Turkin, founder and farmer at the beautiful Dig Farm in North Salem, New York. Joined with my buddy over there, Ms. Ivan Polarska. How are you doing today? Uh, today it's cold, but uh, my behind become gorgeous like four days ago. My behind is start just blooming. Oh my God, I, I am so happy. And I know this is a podcast, so a lot of people can't see it. But if you're on a Facebook and you can look it up the video, I have a beautiful huckleberry. I uh, just put the seeds on January 11th. And they're all beautiful, popping out like crazy, and I love it. So my behind, behind me, it's gorgeous. Huckleberry, wow, okay. Yeah, Huckleberry <laughs> Gordon. Can't say it. Yes. Had Huckleberry that I know of. Huckleberry pie, Brian? I don't no? think so. Huckleberry's all one right. of the cartoon character, right? Yes, it is. That's yeah. why that is it, true. That's why it pop up for me like bam, bam. It's like they, you know, the, listen, the plants know I love my cartoons. So true. Well, and bam, bam is another one. Pop out. <laughs> bam, bam is another one. Obviously, is Yvonne is excited because she started uh, some stuff. We will get to that in a second. Brian, how you doing? Kill any plants lately? Hanging in there. <laughs> Actually, I, I think I've managed to save a couple since uh, oh, the last show. We, we wound up taking some time off that we didn't mean to with some equipment failure in the studio yeah. but meanwhile I, I i think i figured out that some of the plants here were just not getting enough light so i brought in some of the the grow lamps that i had and uh, it seems to be helping nice. i'll let you know yeah that's yes. awesome plants love light so i'm sure it's helping yeah our <laughs> windows here happen to face north so you're not getting as much as you would you know, even in the summertime, it's a big difference. In the summer, everything was growing fine, but in yeah. the winter, it's not doing so great. So, little little boost there, and it seems to be working. <laughs> Look at that! You, you, know. you didn't kill anything. You saved things, and you're using a grow light. Or so it, I, it might be plant hospice over here. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out by <laughs> next week. <laughs> well, we will see. But our fingers are crossed, and our hopes are high for you, Brian. So keep Thank up you. the good work. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> And today on Getting Dirty, we are joined with our special guest, Miss Amy Benroff from um, Our New Way Gardens, farmer, founder, executive director, ma mover, shaker, maker of <laughs> things happening. Amy, welcome to Getting Dirty. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> we are we are happy to have you here um everybody knows that i uh am all about dig farm is all about connections and things going on and amy and i had met several years ago How, that was that was probably what like was that four years ago maybe yeah maybe gosh wow maybe, yeah. um <laughs> yes, at a at a BFA function at Harvest Moon, and uh, we connected originally, and I learned about Amy and knew that she had cool things going on, and she met me, and, you know, we kind of talked and said, oh, we should do something at some point, and uh, now, years later, we've both been doing our things, and um, our new A Gardens is growing, and uh, Dig Farm, obviously, is growing, so we wanted to have Amy on to talk to us about what she has going on. So Amy, first of all, how did you get into growing things? So I've always loved um, 
plants and nature from a, a little kid from summer camp in the woods and things like that. And um, but I studied art and dance education in college. And and as a dancer in New York, my first job was taking care of plants for a company called Blondie's Treehouse. So I used to go to all like these corporate buildings and um, and take care of plants, indoor plants. And I actually still have some uh, cuttings from plants that I, that I took care of back then. So I've always loved plants and nature. And then I moved out of the city when my kids were young and I um, used to go to a local farm and the farmer there was talking to me all the time about how it was hard to get his mortgage going. And, and I decided to kind of dive in and help because I loved the farm and I loved to get the fresh produce there. And I realized there was too much debt on the property and he ended up having to sell it. That's like a whole long story. But anyway, I, um, there was, my dad's office was not too far from the farm and there was a huge grass lawn there. And so in, instead of just mourning the loss of the land, a friend of mine and I uh, asked if we could start growing some vegetables on the grass there in response to the loss of this beautiful farmland like around the corner. Wow. How I started. So um, did did you were you um I mean taking care of plants, but were you hands in right now you grow a lot of produce, a lot of vegetables. <laughs> so where did that um come from? Did that come from working on the farm? So that came from starting that garden. So I worked with a young farmer um named Michael Yokin who had grown um had done a lot of work in organic farms in California and was also permaculture trained. And so we started with a small area, but it, it quickly grew. Um, and I think also in my life, I've always thought about, you know, the, like the problems that we face it globally as a society and like, how do we even begin to address them? And to me, like food, is such a, gr a common denominator. And to, so for me, like growing healthy food and helping make it available to people was a very basic way to begin to address um, problems that, that I see in our world. Um, Absolutely. I always say everybody eats. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so everybody eats it's, it's I mean, that definitely levels it. There's not not one person that can't relate to being hungry, or to eating something delicious. That's something that we all as human beings share. Um, so how did that? I want to segue that into how that how our new way gardens was formed and tell us about it and what you do and what's the mission and all of it. Okay. So uh, he and I would talk a lot and dream a lot about like how gardening and farming could really make changes in the world. And um, we started by just mapping it out, like all the different aspects of how, uh, what, what the, the earth and the generosity of the earth can bring. And, um, and then um, Pep, I actually was so, when I started PepsiCo Green, uh, PepsiCo Corporation, their headquarters is around the corner, not too far from where we are, also where the first garden was also. And they had just acquired a piece of land uh, that was a nursery and had an old greenhouse on it. And so I was through a connection of a friend of my daughter's father was uh, worked at PepsiCo and he was able to get me connected with the person who was in charge of uh, global real estate, whose name is Carl Chileski. He's been a champion of our New Way Garden since then. So um, we started seeds there and uh, they were doing farmer's markets. And I met uh, another farmer at the farmer's market named Russell Greenleaf, who was doing um, uh, educational programs at uh, St. Christopher's, which is a residential facility for um, uh, teenagers with autism and other special needs. And so he wanted to come in and start seeds with me in the greenhouse. So we started <laughs> working together in the greenhouse. And then he subsequently left for Hawaii and left me in charge of his program. And oh my he gosh. never came back. <laughs> so wow. I, so I inherited his program, which has been, I've been now there for, this is my 11th year. Wow. Um, 
teaching wow. um, kids, um, high school kids as part of their life and vocational training program. So anyway, after he left, there was a woman who was working with him who um, we decided to incorporate as a nonprofit at that time. So she and I created our new way garden and she moved on um, shortly after it wasn't quite the right fit for her, but um, that was how it started. And uh, I was able to incorporate because I now had a contract with the school district, you know, before I was just growing and giving away food. And so that was what enabled me to start to have some income and to get an organization going. That's exciting. What, um, so what is your mission? What is the mission of our new way garden? So we have a three prong mission. It's um, uh, food uh, justice basically oriented. So helping people who don't easily access uh, healthy produce because it's not easily available to everyone. Um, and so that's the first part. So uh, growing food and, and, and working on equitable food distribution. And then the second piece is environmental stewardship. So tending the land, caring about, the, caring for the land, caring for the earth, biodiversity, the soil, all of that, and then education about all of that. So it's, that's kind of our, our mission. Um, that's and, amazing. And now, um, uh, yeah, go, uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, and so now, uh, I guess it's been like 14 years, 14 years later, we grow <laughs> in seven gardens. Well, we're adding two new ones this year. We grow about 20,000 pounds of produce a year. Um, we donate. Boom. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, so, so humbly she throws it out there. We, we donate 20,000 pounds. Of yeah. Produce a year. You know, that's amazing. <laughs> So what that's what I was say, uh, that's what I was going to say and ask you is like how many gardens do you have because you're not only in one place creating all that beauty and and sharing all this amazing food with people you actually have multiple gardens so you just said seven you adding two more no the seven make five we have five and adding two more makes seven locations wow really. So the new King Street Garden is near is on corporate land. So the idea we don't own any of the land that we grow in. So the idea is that there's so many uh, potential spaces for growing commercial, corporate, private. So this is a commercial land. There's a an office building there, which is kind of fun because people come out from their lunch breaks to the garden and we can share. I can give them vegetables. They can, you know, ask me things about growing their own food or just to have a nice break and walk through through the garden and enjoy a little bit of nature. Um, it's like a nice intersection. Yeah. Uh, so then um, we also grow at, at a country club. Um, Old Oaks Country Club donated for like about four and a half acres of land and we do a CSA from there, which we can talk about. Um, I guess I could talk about it now. It's a it, the model is um, that w we donate at least as much as we sell. So everybody who supports the CSA pays uh, a significant contribution beyond the value of their own vegetables, so that we are able to give away e an equal or greater amount um, on that uh, of that produce. Um, so it's been successful. We have about forty members annually. Um, if anybody's interested. Um, our, our website you can find out more information about it wow. um, yeah so that's the country club project and then um, uh, the town of Harrison has a park in Silver Lake called the John Pasadomo Memorial Veterans Memorial Park and they had an old town pool there that's been sitting <laughs> untended you might know it for years and so I spoke with the mayor and he was amazingly supportive and wonderful um, and he, they excavated out the pool and filled it in with dirt. And this will be our fifth season growing produce there. And there's a lovely woman um, named Nancy Wagner who lives in that neighborhood, who I met through the BFA actually. She came to a volunteer event that I had um, and she has overseen uh, the tending of that garden um, for year, for years. Um, it's a, she's a wonderful farmer. Wow. And then the Reach Academy is the school that I teach at uh, for the kids, um, the high school that I teach at. And they have a small garden on their grounds that we built up because of COVID. So they 
uh, the principal of that school uh, is a wonderful um, uh, administrator and he had the vision of having them out in the community as much as possible. So they have vans and bus transportation. They used to have it five days a week, but since COVID it's kind of changed and now we're at like three to four days a week, but they would come to all the various our new garden locations. And um, during COVID they couldn't travel. So we built gardens at the school. So that's another and kind of a relatively new location. And at the PepsiCo headquarters, they just built a wonderful um, uh, employee vegetable garden, which is wow. beautiful. <laughs> so uh, that's shared with um, the uh, landscaping company that takes care of the PepsiCo grounds. A bunch of their employees um, love to garden and are great farmers. And so they're growing all kinds of stuff in the garden and employees from PepsiCo and their food service and um and our new way garden has a section in there too um that's that is so um, go ahead i'm sorry yeah. no so keep that's, going keep that's going the, so those, <laughs> the, those are the, the ones that we've had so far and then this year through the westchester land trust we were introduced to two northern um farms jade farm and i can't remember what george's farm is called do you know george i farm? don't like, remember either uh, but anyway, those are new. So those are these are two new um, private landowners who are interested in how um, having their land uh, be a part of feeding, helping feed people. Um, so it's kind of beautiful. Um, and I work with um, several farmers and lots of volunteers, and uh, it's it's really wonderful work. I love it. You know, I feel really, <laughs> I feel really, you know, blessed. It's hard work. It's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. In so many yes. Ways. People always say that, oh my gosh, it's so much work, but I always say also, and I know Yvonne knows the same thing, but when you're doing something like that and you love it, it is so rewarding. That's, it's not, um, it's physical, but it's not hard, you know, yes. it is, it is, it is definitely repays, repays so big and mentally, physically that you're extremely happy of doing what you're doing. I have a quick question and I just want to elaborate um, simply on your CSA because there's a lot of farms, there's a lot of places do have CSA, which are very important, but your CSA, it's also doing something extra than everybody else's, which you are able to produce and provide people with food that cannot afford it. Can you simply explain your CSA to actually have people to sign up and be involved with this such a wonderful thing? Sure. So the CSA, hmm, let's see where I start. I guess I can start by signing up is just going onto the website and you go into the CSA page and you click like the join button and it takes you to the donation page. Um, that's just the way that Squarespace has their um, signups. And then if you just click on there's there's a couple of categories for the CSA. So there's a full share and there's a half share. And I want to say it doesn't say this on the website. I it might say it, but doesn't say it on the donation page. But we are sliding scale too. So if the the cost is prohibitive for somebody and they still do want to contribute but can't quite um, meet the full amount. I am definitely open to working with people who are interested in joining and supporting in any way that they can. And we can work out some other ways to make it happen. But anyway, so full share is um, 16 weeks of uh, produce. It's at least 10 varieties and at least 10 pounds every week. Um, the boxes are left at in coolers at the farm and uh, everything is ready after 3 p.m. on Thursdays. And people can pick up from 3 p.m. on Thursdays until Sunday evening. And then whatever's left Monday morning that people haven't picked up, then we donate the rest of it. So, um, and then the half share is, is available too. So nothing goes to waste, basically. <laughs> it's, to it's waste. Nothing no. goes to waste. No, no not at all. We, yeah. and, um, yes. Um, why don't we take this opportunity to jump to our first break and then we will be right back after this. <laughs> HudsonRiverRadio.com Hey everybody, looking for something to do in the afternoon? Well, so am I. So why not join me, Neil Richter, in the Richter Observatory, high atop the majestic Palisades, overlooking the mighty Hudson River in beautiful Stony Point. 
three full hours every weekday from 3 until 6 p.m. We'll get you through the afternoon at work and rock you on your ride home. That's the Richter Observatory with me, Neil Richter, right here on HudsonRiverRadio.com. Subscribe to the Richter Observatory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. Jennifer Lorenzo here. Did you know you can now subscribe to all of Hudson River Radio's podcasts, including Let's Talk History? You can hear our podcasts anytime and anywhere. You can also sponsor one of our shows to get your message heard locally and around the world. Just shoot an email to info at HudsonRiverRadio.com and we'll get you started. That's info at HudsonRiverRadio.com. Subscribe to Let's Talk History on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. HudsonRiverRadio.com. Once the mics are hot, you can't stop. And we are back here on Getting Dirty, and we are talking to to a farmer, Amy Benaroff, from Our New Way Gardens, and she is telling us all about the amazing places and gardens that she has and the tons, the pounds and pounds of produce that she is um, able to give away. And you were mentioning before, Amy, that you are teaching. Um, what age level kids are you teaching? And can you just give us a rough, rough synopsis of what you're teaching them? Sure. So um, right now I'm just working with the REACH Academy. I've taught at a lot of different schools in the area, but the programming has shifted recently. So um, I love working with kids of all ages, um, but the kids that I work with right now are pre predominantly uh, high school age, some middle school kids, but mostly high school. And it's a full year program, which is another benefit. A lot of times schools are out in the summer. And so a lot of the wonderful things that happen in the garden they miss, they miss out on, but this is a full year program. So I see the kids all year round. And so they're really getting exposed to every season in the garden. Uh, we just finished the fall. We did a lot of harvesting and seed saving and food preservation kind of things um, in the fall. Uh, the winter time we do seed sorting and we do um, make things with things that we've saved from the garden. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the garden is a really beautiful place um, for everyone. There's always some entry point for, for anyone. Like I have a lot of kids who they have their really fancy, you know, Jordan sneakers and, and they don't want to get them dirty. And I'm like, I don't want you to get them dirty either. You know? yeah. so let's figure out what can you do in the garden? You know, how can you help? How can you participate? Uh, sometimes I have baggies and I have them like just rubber band baggies around their feet. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Some of them really don't like the dirt and they don't like the bugs, but like, for example, seed sorting, they will sit at the table with their friends and shell beans like all day long. And you get to hear so many wonderful conversations around, you know, the activity. It's very relaxing to be doing it with your hands and working with your hands. And then you learn, you know, they learn things about each other and share things that you might not hear in a regular classroom setting. Um, and I know a lot of them really love watering and love um, tending the plants. I have one student um, named Donovan. He's a, I call him the pastor of the garden. <laughs> the first day I met him, his first day at school, he came to the greenhouse and he said to me, Miss Amy, Miss Amy, the plants they just want to grow. But he said, people, they want to destroy things and we wreck things and we do all this crazy stuff. And he said, but the plants, they just want to grow, you know, oh and so goodness. it was like so beautiful. That's Isn't so awesome. it? Uh, it? That is, I mean, it's so amazing the train of thought, though, that people have. And when you see that moment of enlightenment kind of coming along and just, you know, they find some sort of beauty in the nature, you know? Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite things to say is like you put one seed in the ground and one seed will give you so many, you know, it's like this abundance, this, you know. Yes, it is. And a lot of kids don't know it. And when they see it and they interact with it, it makes them so happy. But also, I think it makes them much more appreciated of the hard work and the rewarding. So I think hopefully we get in um, more, more gardens, you know, to be and farmers to be to grow the fresh food and share it with people and just just 
you know, being in nature. That's that's one that's one of the most wonderful thing. Uh, at the last time that we were having a show before Brian broke everything in the studio um, and we didn't have any more shows going, uh, we had the gentleman from Connecticut, uh, from Mystic, and he was talking about his um, kids coming over and there were um, uh, kids with the needs. So a lot of times when it came, they had to have people with them. And eventually the people, the teachers that come with the kids, they were able to leave them alone. Just like he explained, the soil, the garden, it makes the person much more relax and, um, and easy yeah. and 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 read the nature and it's like whoa we really you know it's it is amazing if you give it a chance of allowing yourself to be taken by the nature it's 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 so good for you but it's so amazing that you will never let it go yeah my opinion no i agree i see it all the time it's very calming and soothing you know these are the kids that i teach have a lot of challenges and um, often uh, have had a lot of trauma or they go into crisis, you know, and I very rarely have that in the garden program because it's very calming and grounding. And like I said, there's something for everybody there. You know, there's yeah. a way in, even if you just like to snack. <laughs> <laughs> it's that still is a so good true. snack. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is so true. Um, I also wanted to touch on what type of agriculture culture you're doing in these gardens. So can you talk a little bit about your technique and what you're doing in the garden? Sure. So like my favorite way to grow is very, very uh, light. I like to let nature do a lot of talking and I like to push back lightly. Um, but that is not always the, the easiest way to grow um, a lot of food. So um, and in a big space to do that, you would need just a lot of people. Um, so like the four, like if we had 20 people farming at the four and a half acre farm, we could probably ditch the tractor, but we basically have one main farmer there and then one or two assistants throughout the, the season. And so we need the tractor and we do do a lot light tilling there, not deep tilling, but light. And the soil there has taken a, a while to, to build. I mean, Andrew is an incredible farmer. He's a a uh, fifth generation farmer from Michigan. He grew up on a 400 acre farm. He knows how to grow everything. Wow. He, um, he is working very hard with that soil. We're trying to build up the organic matter. We're gonna do some more. We have did some soil testing some years back, but we're gonna do some more soil testing. It's a big space and there's a lot of variety there. So, so managing that land, we bring in compost um, and um, we do, you know, turn in a lot of the, the weeds and stuff at the end of the season to build up the organic material. And we do use um, some fertilizers there, organic fertilizers there. And we use um, uh, azomite, A to Z mineral sometimes too, when we're planting. Uh, that I use in, in all the gardens. Um, and so, but uh, the, the new King Street Garden, we started on grass and it's never been tilled ever. So it was just layered upon um, and the soil there is so beautiful and so rich and so wonderful. And it's, you know, and I love the weeds. I let the weeds grow because of the, <laughs> that they also contribute in, you know, um, I learned, I took a course with um, Dan Kittrich at the, B uh, at the BFA, which was incredible. And I will never forget how he talked about like the earth doesn't like to be uncovered. She likes to be covered. And so I, you know, weeds can act that way. You can use a cover crop, but you know, we have like a lot of comfrey in the garden. And so I leave it until I want to grow something else there. And then once I want to grow something else, then I'll lift up the weeds. And then you can, a lot of the weeds are medicinal. So you can dry them and use them in teas and tinctures and salves and, um, or you can just layer them as a as a blanket on another bare patch of land, <laughs> act as a covering. So that the kind that's kind of the te technique. Nothing gets lost. Everything gets recycled and reused. We use wood chips a lot. I love wood chips for pathways. Um, cardboard even we use often to suppress weeds. Um, sometimes I do solarizing, which is um, you know, just covering with a tarp, either a clear plastic tarp or or not clear plastic, but um, as a way to um, just clear land for planting something else. We definitely rotate crops all the time. We don't plant the same thing in the same place. Um, 
I think I could improve my um, my uh, direct specific application of minerals. Like that's something that I'm looking forward to working on in the next couple of years. Like it's I have um, some new young farmers coming in to work with me. Uh, um, Akio and Kelly, and I think it's going to free up my time to really start to get even more uh, honed in and specific on the, the needs of the, of the different gardens. Wow. Um, Do you notice a big difference in the, the soil in your different locations? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the no-till garden in New King Street where the weeds do, you know, so much work and the soil there is just incredible. I mean, it's full of life. And there's so much biodiversity. I mean, so many things come up. Like this year, motherwort started growing in the garden, you know, and I know never planted it there. Or you know, there's so many beautiful volunteers that come up. Um, and I learn a lot from, it's a luxury to learn a lot from watching a, a garden go like to the edge of wild because you get to see how plants do it themselves, how, who pushes back on who, who takes over a lot, who mines the soil and makes it really light and fluffy and who like spreads out and holds on to the soil and grabs it, you know? And, and yep. so um, learning all of those things, the plants can do a lot of the work that our machinery would otherwise be doing. Like comfrey is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite plants and it's all over the new King Street garden, but I don't mind it because it's very easy to, pop out of the ground, you know, you maybe even leave a little root in the bottom and it'll come back, but the yep. roots are full of nutrients and you use them to mulch around plants, you use them to build compost, to make tea, um, and and they mine the soil and they loosen the soil and they, they make it easy to work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They add nutritional benefit to the soil for sure. I think that's one of the, uh, one of the hardest things you know, if you think about BFA and Dan Kittrich, it's kind of, it's a different model than how people were raised to garden. And we've mentioned this before, the idea of, okay, I have to have my tomato plant and nothing else around it and cleaned <laughs> out and, you know, but nature doesn't work that way. And you realize the benefits of having all of these different, I'm a huge advocate of biodiversity. Um, you know, we, we, we have areas that we didn't utilize this season and, you know, they go basically wild and we manage them down at the end of the season to get prepped out for next season um but you you're right you learn a lot and you see how things interconnect with each other um so i i always find that funny and you know people are always like what you 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 don't you know rip everything out and clean it up you know and it's like no you really don't want to do that and when you start explaining soil to people and the interconnectedness of everything underneath the soil then it starts to make sense to them and you can see why that way just makes sense and it is more natural i like the um imagery that you used of you know you nature speaks loud and you just push back gently and i always feel like that too like we're just taking this space for what we need to grow but we're respecting the rest of the space and i feel that way as well yeah well, i always have a hard time reading <laughs> oh, it's a plant, you know? but also that will give you ability of snapping the photos and find out what it is like you said comfrey it's good for the soil, but it's also good for us that you can use it in different different ways and actually eat it and use the tea. So if you do have something growing that you're not sure what it is, you can take a photo of it, figure out what it is, if it's medicinal, what to do it, how to do it. And then um, again, nothing goes to waste and you incorporate the nature with whatever we want to grow. I think that's awesome. Yeah, and um, the other thing about the weeds too is that from what I, I think it's, I'm not quite sure of the exact numbers because I think there are different schools of thought, but something like 60% of the energy that plants make from the sun, they feed into the microorganisms in the soil and then the rest they use to grow themselves. So the plants, the plants feed us and they feed all the life in the soil. Yep. So yes. Of, and the life in the soil feeds them. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yes. Right. So it's if, a circle of life. Right. And so if you have bare soil, you have nobody feeding the microorganisms in the soil. And then it's like, you know, you can have all the compost you want on top of there. But if you don't have the life in the soil and the roots of the plants doing that, you know, incredible 
incredible thing that they do with sunlight, you you know, your your soil is not going to be very productive. Yeah. That is very true. Yeah. So oh go ahead, Yvonne. No, I was just going to say, so what is your favorite vegetable? <laughs> No, oh, I, I, you know, I was thinking about that one. Like, I don't really, I don't know that I have a favorite vegetable. Just say a cucumber. <laughs> I, <would. laughs> I um, uh, Maybe pumpkins. I don't know. Squash. I think those are wonderful um, to grow. Nice. I, I, I love them all. <laughs> okra, I love okra. Okra is like got the most beautiful flower. Oh, yes. Yes. I you finally, love, wait. I, are we talking to eat or to grow? Because there's oh, a distinction both. there. Both. 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 Okay. Good for you. How do you how do you uh how do you eat okra? What's your preferred method? <laughs> I finally I finally got We're her still on board. having this um debate. <laughs> I finally got her on board. So we actually had some okra growing last year and it was gorgeous. Go ahead, so, Emmy. <laughs> so guess what? I have students who've never had okra before who will come to the garden and if you pick the little ones yes. and you eat them raw, they are so delicious. And I have really I love it. I have these kids just picking raw okra and eating it. Like, can I have some more? That is a photo oh, so, op right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, so cool. But you know, I love that aspect of it too. You know, you think it's probably the, the same kids that didn't want to get their Jordans dirty, but uh, you know, after they spent some time, now they know. Oh, let me pick that small okra and chow down on it. You know, yeah. um, which is it's that's a beautiful thing right there. That's kind yes. of like the completion of the mission. To you know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I love that they'll pick kale and you know they'll just you know they're picking things and eating and trying. Even like the weed, the sorrel. You know the. The little yes. flowers, they love that one. They'll walk around with like bunches of it, just nibbling on the. Nice. On the yes. While it's like and it's cool that they can now look down and identify those things. And then they tell their friends, check this out. You can eat this and, you know, all of that stuff, yep. which is exciting as well. Um, so any other favorite things to grow oh, or to oh. eat? Um, Tulsi. Tulsi. <laughs> what is that? Tulsi yes. is holy basil. So I have some friends from India and they brought me some Tulsi seed. And so I've been growing it for four years now and I, I collected lots of it. So anybody who's interested in growing more Tulsi too, I have a lot of beautiful Tulsi seed. And um, I don't know, I don't know what it is. Well, the little purple flowers are just so beautiful and delicate. And I love to just like pick a leaf and eat it and share it with other people. It, it's a it's a magical plant. It's very sacred in in India. They ha keep it in their temples, and so I love that aspect of it. And it's also um, an adaptogen, which is something that if like your temperature is too high, it'll lower it. If it's too low, it'll raise it. If your wow. blood pressure is too high, it lowers it. So it helps balance. It's not like doing one direction only. It can it can balance things very um, wonderfully. So and it tastes nice too. And the smell is amazing. Oh, yeah, yes. I mean, you can. I love smelling it in the garden. You know, you just get that whiff of it when you walk by, and oh, I love it too. It's really great. Um, okay, so should we do our second break, and then we will come back right after this. This is HudsonRiverRadio.com. Christopher Schweitzer here. You like sports and you don't care who knows. So come join me for the Sports Report. We'll be talking about everything going on in sports today, a little bit of sports history, and take some calls so you can join in on the discussion. The Sports Report with Chris the Intern, only on HudsonRiverRadio.com. Subscribe to the Sports Report on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Linda Zimmerman. Join Michael Warden and me for Murder in the Hudson Valley. We'll look into notorious homicide cases from around the region and follow the case from the moment the crime scene is discovered up to the final verdict. We'll discuss the suspects, evidence, forensic techniques, and legal battles used to identify and convict the guilty. Murder in the Hudson Valley, only on HudsonRiverRadio.com. Subscribe to Murder in the Hudson Valley on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. HudsonRiverRadio.com. The dot com makes it cool. 
And we're back on Getting Dirty, talking about growing all kinds of things, one of them being okra, which we're going to try again, and I'm going to learn to love <laughs> again That's this right. season. <laughs> okra gets um, slimy, though. That's the problem, like, if you don't do it quite right. And I think that's what's yeah. off-putting for a lot of people. Well, like um, Amy said, you just got to pick them little ones. You can put them a fish. I mean, if you bake your fish, put a okra, potatoes around the fish, put it in a, you know, in a foil, put it in an oven and just let it bake. And that that okra, it's not slimy at all, at all. It's it's okay. delicious. <laughs> all right. I made my point. That's OK. Yes. Go on with the show. <laughs> uh, um, well, Amy, you have now seven gardens and you are growing an amazing amount of, of beautifully organic, regenerative permaculture food, which, as we know, is the best food that people should be eating and the way that people should be looking to eat their food. You are educating kids. You are bringing people into the garden. So AKA you are building community, which is a beautiful thing. Um, but how does that relate to the mission, you know, the higher purpose of the mission? And I know we share a common belief in the essential need for strong local food systems. So can you talk about that a little? Yeah, so I feel like I spent, I feel like what I, what I feel like is there's a bunch of us in Westchester who have been head to the ground, working hard, building, 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 growing food, creating, you know, connections in our area. And now all of a sudden we're kind of looking up and we're like, hey, 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 we're seeing each other and it's time to work, to come together and really organize and coordinate a really strong local food system that helps support um, everybody in Westchester County. So that we, uh, I think there's so many ways that a local food system can uplift um, economic opportunity, you know, uplift and bring economic opportunities, um, help, you know, expand and, and improve health for people, um, for everyone. And I think that uh, it can't be, it's a coordinated effort. I, 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 and so I feel like now my next phase is to really start to connect with people like you, Allison, that we can start to work together and um, make sure that uh, I think, no, I, I'm sorry, I'm fumbling with how to exactly. Oh, no, you're excited. That's right. <laughs> well, when we get excited, <laughs> we can fumble, blum, 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 blum. So if you listen to any of those podcasts, you're going to hear me go blah, 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 blah. And until she said what I said, nobody knows it. I get excited. All right. Just like about my seeds. My she gets little fired baby. up. And then, so yes. go ahead, Amy. So I, I guess the analogy that I use a lot is one person working an hour in the garden, uh, sorry, working two hours in the garden will not get nearly as much done as two people working one hour. And so there's something about when you collaborate and you work together that exponentially um, increases what is accomplished. And so I feel like it's time now to really make sure that the food that there's enough land and there's enough um, uh, interest, I think, in, in and enough resource in Westchester that if we come together in a really, really thoughtful and care, caring way, we can be very autonomous in our food system. And the food system can help really um, create jobs and opportunities for um, for everyone here, that we we really have a resource flow. I almost think of it as a river, like the river of resource flows and touches everyone, and everyone touches the river and passes it on. And so, um, I think that's kind of the next part of of the process. Uh, and I think it's it's important because the way that our current um, agri agricultural system functions. Um, you know, nationally and globally, I don't believe is sustainable. So, yeah. Well, yes. thanks to people like you getting involved and moving along, like Allison and you and BFA. I mean, just to bring it out, every time when we speak more and more with different gardeners, farmers, uh, people involved with food, growing food, it's like BFA, BFA. So BFA is also a wonderful place to be involved with because 
not only that you learn different things, you actually uh, calibrate with different people that are involved with BFA. There's a lot of different places that you can also be involved and, and connect with everything. But so far, BFA, it's a wonderful um, place to be involved and get in touch with people around it. I think it's awesome. I think BFA is a great common ground for, See, like she, Amy was I saying. I speak and then she figured it out what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm agreeing with you that BFA, yes, yes. You, you know, whether you're, um, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a gardener or whether it's just, a, you know, you have a plant in a window, um, the soil being the common ground. So whatever it is that you're doing, having that, that base of information and knowledge um, which is important because this type of this type of agriculture is not only about growing healthy food; it's also about helping to mitigate climate change and stabilize environments in our area. Um, because you know, you alluded to the the food system that we currently have now, and not only is it unsustainable for multiple reasons but it's extremely detrimental to the environment um so these are all things that we should be thinking about in terms of you know amy do you have any thoughts on elaborating on why our system is so unsustainable <laughs> so i that well one thing that i thought of saying earlier and now i think it comes back around is that in this country less than two percent of the population are farmers and so it's not going to be sustainable to have such a small percentage of population feeding everybody. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to just add to that. And not only that, but over 50% of them are like over 55 or 65 years old. Right. So it's an aging population as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so, uh, you know, call to young people who like the yes. earth, let's <laughs> farm together. And many hands make light work. So the more farmers we have, you know, it's been, it's hard, hard work for us, Allison, because there's not a lot of support for farmers right now. Che like the, the unsustainable food system makes food very cheap. And so to try to sell food and make a living is nearly impossible because um, the, the monocrop agribusinesses, the way we have it, make an un unrealistic low price on food. And so um, if we, one of the other pieces is to figure out how do we make farming uh, a viable uh, occupation because if it's not we're really in trouble yeah <laughs> so, like I, yep. I, I applied for a grant and they were like well you know community gardens don't really create economic opportunity and I was like well you know we can have a lot of computer software programmers but they have to eat and so yeah. you know, yes. we, don't, we don't also find ways to support and make farming viable we don't have food for anybody um so that's part of like putting all of our heads together and coming up with the solutions about how do we, um, in, in, you know, find a way. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. Like sometimes I think like municipalities would have farmers, like they have teachers and like they have um, uh, parks and rec people and like they have mayors, you know, they also have farmers. Um, mm -hmm. And then they have a salary and then the and then the farmer is not dependent on how much they sell food they sell to make their living, which is what a huge stress of of uh, being a farmer becomes um, and educational programs are also like just finding different income streams to help sustain to, to make it sustainable. Um, so that's one thing. I mean, obviously, the the um, toxins that we are used in in um, the current agricultural system, how much chemicals and chemical and tilling and monocropping. Um, there's a really wonderful film called Queen of the Sun. Do you know that movie? No. Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. It's actually about the honeybees, but it touches on a lot of the issues with um, uh, our current ag system because the bees are are the kind of front line of uh, of um, feel they're the like litmus they're the ones feeling the most what the effects of of the um that the destructive aspects and so this movie it's a beautiful film if anybody's it's like the canary in the coal mine theory exactly. 
exactly right. The bees are the canary in the coal mine and that what they're telling us is got to change this or we're not going to make it. And I think, you know, we're not too far behind if we don't <laughs> change it. Yeah, absolutely. That's so true. That's again, why the, why the, the importance of what you're doing is so critical because every time you can turn another light bulb on to somebody who says, why should I even care about this or have somebody understand that, um, you know, there is a, there is a high cost to cheap food and, yeah. you know, there are ways around that, that, you know, either growing it yourself, participating in a community garden, um, you know, depending on your means, supporting farmers directly that are growing like this mm -hmm. um it is a big undertaking so yeah. well, a quick question like i mean we all know that we try to provide as much as we can regarding volunteers to come and help to see what it takes and taste the fresh food from the vines so that way you do have a, a much better idea of the taste and freshness and everything else what would you say to anybody who never had a garden and let's say a star garden, what, what's, what's the, um, that spark? What would you, how would you put a spark in somebody? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, just start, you know, start with something small and simple like beans, like beans are wonderful to grow. They grow fast and they're very generous and they condition soil. And so if you have a piece of land, a little piece of land, put some bean seeds in the ground and, uh, or, you know, a pot, uh, you know, any, you know, growing anything really just getting started. Um, and I think the biggest mistake that people who start, you know, some people are like, I have a brown thumb. No, don't but get rid of that. <laughs> Nobody has a brown thumb. You just have to practice. Hey, Brian, you heard that, Brian? I never <laughs> yeah, said I had a brown that? thumb. I just go from zero <laughs> to killing, right? Yeah, just, he, he has a no thumb. <laughs> Yeah, don't, I don't thumb. need the thumb. <laughs> yeah. You have to keep practicing and keep trying. But also, I think one of the things people do more than anything is over water in the beginning. And so rotting out the roots is is like the, the you know, the the worst. Plants have a much harder time recovering from overwatering than anything mm. else. Um, but don't give up. And, you know, I think of myself as like, okay, I'm just down this road of growing for however many years I've done it, you know, and there's people who have been doing it, you know, many, many more years, like I think about Andrew, so he's got five generations, right? So he's got five generations, and now he's walking down the road. And so if you're just starting out, just find some people who are a little further down the road and ask a yeah. lot of questions. And, you know, it's a very, very basic human um, activity yes it's in every, yes it's in everyone i i always say when i teach in the low like the lower schools like preschool and kindergarten i've never met an elementary school kid who refused to put a seed in the ground like you get <laughs> yeah. you know, they never say oh i don't want to do that they love it <laughs> yeah it's so basic to you know and they're fascinated by seeds Yes, it's yep. so true. And I, uh, I get the biggest kick out of having kids in the garden and um, my buddy Jen Weege, you know, who has two beautiful twins, and uh, they spent some time with me at the Westchester Land Trust Garden. And, you know, I literally had them Plant, they were planting tiny seedlings and then by the end of the season they were harvesting the eggplants off of those seedlings and you know they were young and you can kind of send them in and let them you know they can do it they can do it from a young age they can plant seeds and they can plant stuff and they know and they come back and they water and they take an interest in it um and it's pretty fulfilling to have them go that full cycle you know Definitely. Yeah. And they're happy. They're happy because they they're doing something different. And they, and guess what? Every kid want to play in the dirt. So, you know, there are some adults that <laughs> like to play in the dirt, but there are a lot of kids that do want to play in the dirt. Anyway, before we continue, because I would like to ask you, uh, Amy, uh, how, you know, people can uh, get in touch with you, your website and everything else. But before we go to that, we have uh, a secret word for Lee. Yes. And it is. Um, okay. So, Jumbo. yes, I. <laughs> da, 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 da. Well, today being Martin Luther King Day, and uh, you have a bunch of us here who all, all are dreamers and think big thoughts and want to make amazing things happen. So, the word of the day for Mill River is dreams. dreams. So, go in and tell Lee your dreams, and she will give you a discount. 
Well, I don't know if she wants to know everybody's dreams, but (laughs) definitely a dream. Keep the dreams short, but, you know, choose one dream, the best one, and, you know, let her know and then receive your discount at Mill River Supply. Thank you for the reminder, Yvonne. Um, But, Amy, yes, as we are getting ready to wrap up over here, why don't do you do you take volunteers? How do people get in contact with you? How can people help? What is your you know, how do you how do you want people to reach out to you? So the best way uh, is through the website, you know, through our our New Way Garden at ournewwaygarden.com. And there's a a button there. You can email us and let us know there's a, you know, a volunteer form or you can even just send an email to our newwaygarden at gmail.com, just expressing interest. And then we will be sending out um, regular emails as the season comes along about volunteer opportunities and um, oftentimes, if somebody's really interested in coming very regularly and getting really involved, you can um, reach out to me and we can I have a, a, a phone, you know, I'll call you or you can call me on the phone and we can talk about, you know, setting up something that 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 works for both of our schedules. Um, I tend to have sometimes core groups of people that really want to volunteer every week and then people that come now and, and then and so um, we're still working on the volunteer schedule, but I try to do something on the weekend, something in the evening for people, weekday evening after work for people, and then something in the morning for people who maybe are, are home, uh, who have kids or, or, you know, just work in the evenings and want to like volunteer during the daytime. Wow. Do you have all your volunteers and do they go to the different gardens? Yeah, they come to, I mostly will be at PepsiCo and, um, and the Rick's Giving Garden, which is the the pool garden where uh, in in Silver Lake, where the the old town in the town park. Those are the two um, main gardens. Um, but but we'll you know the depending like so for example sometimes we have a lot of currants at we have tons of currant bushes at uh, the the country club farm and so when they're in season it's impossible to pick them all and so it's nice to have like volunteers come and help harvest the currants or you know things like that um we one of the new farms that we're working at uh has a big orchard and so there might be some fruit picking days where we could rally um a larger crew to a a place that we might not regularly have volunteers black currants or red currants or both both (laughs) <laughs> I'm coming. Okay. You gotta tell me what day it is. I'm coming. Okay, I'm great. Coming. Definitely. <laughs> I, love I don't I'm know picking. how many. You know what? She's a great worker and she helps and she works hard. But on current day, I would keep your eye on your quantity of currants because yes. it'll be two for her and one for the bucket. You know? <laughs> but she will help and be great. And yes. I would help too, for sure, of course. Yeah. Well, I'm looking um, forward to working together. You know, we'll figure out. Yeah. To collaborate as we as we move forward this year, that's one of the things I'm most excited about. So are Absolutely, we. yes. So are we for sure. It's yeah. uh, it's my favorite part of this game is these new connections, and I think of us like you know the connections in the soil. You know, we are building these nice little. It's like the tree roots. Yeah. You know how the tree roots, tree roots. Uh, talk to each other and 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 you know. So yeah. it's the tree roots. Communicate. Just the tree roots. There we go. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Amy, any last thoughts going into this season? Any hopes, wishes, desires, any good positive intentions you want to throw out there? Um, Anything else? Um, well, I want to just thank you very much for inviting <laughs> me and for reaching out and for the time being right for us to work together. I mean, I think I think that for this year, I think really building those connections and and coming up with some really good organized strategies and plans to make um, to make this happen is what I'm I'm really hopeful for. Awesome. Me too, for sure. Beautiful. All right. Yvonne, any final thoughts? No, currents. I have currents stuck in my head. All right. <laughs> I know. That's it. She's all about Black currents. and red currents. That's <laughs> I it. have some jam. You have to come get some jam from the season. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, nice. Very cool. Brian, you gonna plant 
collect a new seed or keep something alive? I'm going to do my on? best to keep stuff alive, and I look forward <laughs> to all of your successes and uh, jumping in at whatever brunches that you set up there. After. Yeah, <laughs> I know. We're thinking about doing dinner in a movie this year at the farm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, awesome. Yes. So that's all coming up. Yes, all the exciting <laughs> things that crazy. <laughs> What? Say it again. Maybe Queen of the Sun. Yes, yes the maybe Queen of, Queen the, of sun. the Sun. That would be down. perfect. <laughs> um, yes, excellent. Well, uh, I see that we are slightly over time, but that's okay. <laughs> and um, I am excited. And thank you so much for Amy for being on today with us. And yes, the future looks promising with connections and inspiring new things happening that we will tell more about as time goes on and as they develop. Um, so on that note, everybody, I want to thank you for joining us here on Getting Dirty. I am Allison Turkin and uh, Aviento, everyone. This is HudsonRiverRadio.com. Oh, radio. Uh -huh. HudsonRiverRadio.com, your hometown station. Do you ever get that strange feeling that you're not alone? Is someone or something?